I just started recording. So uh, as I was explaining, uh, uh, exposing your internal functionality and data as services, uh, as APIs are very important for in the modern world, right? Because this is because um, it is not just uh, end product users consume these days, they consume through uh, multiple channels. And these, for example, these partners help you to grow uh, if you expose uh, your infrastructure to your partners, partners can help you grow um, faster than you can do it just on your own. Again, um, they can build value-added services, they can build applications, third-party applications, uh, and they can resell and so on, right? So these are very important for businesses to grow these days. Um, and as I said, Exposing APIs even within your organization is very helpful. So you know what part of uh, your organization is actually providing value to the other parts of the organization, you know, then that yeah, part of the organization has to be grown. Um, sorry, if someone asked a question, uh, I can ask otherwise. Good. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, it's good to have, have you in mute uh, unless you're asking a question. And of course, welcome to, uh, to ask question at any time, right? Um, and these APIs, uh, especially web APIs come in many flavors. And of course, you know, REST, REST is the most popular way people expose APIs these days. Uh, mostly not even very strict RESTful, uh, you know, fully um, uh, well, def like, uh, you know, RESTful is where you, strictly define the media types and then um, exact resource types and all. But uh, even just um, JSON or HTTP is the most common thing people uh, do these days, right? So either REST or RESTful APIs are the most common way people expose this functionality and data. Um, and then we have other flavors. Um, so these are like, um, this very varying percentage, like GraphQL, is kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, popular or, or trendy uh, these days. Uh, but then again, that is also in a way uh, JSON or HTTP, but with a slight uh, variation where you not only have resources as in data, you have direct representation of RPC or uh, procedure invocation style. Uh, and then you have direct uh, RPC style uh, APIs. Uh, gRPC is, is uh, I think, the most common one, but there are other ways you can do RPC as well. Um, these APIs um, are commonly used to communicate within organizations. But uh, again, we are talking about broad uh, sense of APIs, not only to expose to out external, but also internally, right? So gRPC counts as uh, one of the ways you can write APIs. And because we are, we are talking about APIs in a very broad sense, just not just about the JSON uh, REST APIs, right? And of course, you can still see some legacy code using uh, SOAP style old services as well. Um, so uh, let, let me summarize this slide. Uh, for those who just joined. Um, so we talked about why web APIs are very important uh, because this is how you expose your functionality outside, uh, whether it is your clients, whether it is other departments or other organizations, other subbooks within your organization or to your partners. Who's, um, so all three uh, of these channels help you to grow. So it is vital for modern uh, digital uh, digital uh, uh, businesses to have uh, these APIs, right? So um, let me uh, go to the next slide. So um, I'm from WSO2 uh, and we have been in, uh, we are an integration company. We are, our focus is enterprise integrations. So um, two of our main products, uh, two of our main um, well-established products that are API Manager and uh, WSO2 Micro Integrator are directly in this space. Um, 
So WC2 um, API manager is about managing the APIs I talked about earlier. And then uh, let me go a little bit detail what I mean by managing uh, in a bit. And then um, MI is about writing integrations, right? Uh, that is connecting these uh, APIs or services together. Um, and uh, we have uh, our Corio platform. This is um, something we have rolled out uh, a couple of years back. So it's relatively new compared to the other two products, which are kind of uh, matured. Um, so this is where you can host these integrations or any other um, network web exposed uh, apps or services on cloud. So this is a deployment platform, right? So if you go to choreo.dev, you can take a look. So, um, so this is to give you a general idea. I, I want to talk about WSO2 uh, is, the reason I want to talk about WSO2 is to uh, explain how uh, how we got into developing Ballerina uh, programming language, right? Um, so the the reason um uh like uh, uh, so you might be asking question that uh, uh, it's not typical for a, a software company to write their own programming language um sorry may i mute you uh please unmute yourself or uh uh if you want to ask any questions. Um, so as I was explaining, this is a li little bit um, kind of uh, not very typical for a software company to write their own programming language. Usually people uh, get a programming language from outside and use that to develop their products. So I want to explain how uh, WSO2 as a company um, uh, went into the direction of writing uh, a programming language for ourselves. Um, to explain that, uh, let me go into each of these kind of areas a little bit. Uh, so uh, what WSO2MI does, and especially its predecessors, WSO2ESB, um, did uh, is integrate uh, legacy services, um, but it can also now manage newer REST API, REST-like APIs as well. But all the, so it, it has ability to integrate um, all the legacy services, for example, SOAP services and so on, right? And then uh, create uh, integrations between them. That means uh, there are a lot of instances uh, within organizations where you want to uh, get, uh, connect one service, one such API to another API, right? So this is a very common requirement and WSO2 uh, ESB used to fill that space and then now it's a modern version, WS2MI fills that space. Right? Um, and WS2 API manager is where you want to, you know, this with to um, you know add a lot of quality of service uh, layer on top of these uh, APIs. Why do you need that? Because um, when you have an API, you need uh, additional uh, layer of management on top of that because uh, you want to, you don't want anyone to just, you know, pop, just anyone to access your API, right? You might selectively let people to access that APIs for security reasons and also for uh, monetization reasons, right? So you want only these clients or only these people to access that API. And also when you let people access that API, you might also have things like for a uh, given amount of requests, I want to charge this amount of money, or you can only call this API um, 100 times a minute um, and then something like that, right? So those things has to be enforced and uh, all of that can be done through WSO2 API manager. Uh, so how we got into, uh, so as you can see, WSO2 is very uh, tightly integrated in the API uh, ecosystem, right? So we, we have been working with APIs for a long time we, are, we have been helping other companies to develop and um, use APIs to transform their businesses uh, for a long time, right? And um, 
And in this part, what we have noticed is, uh, especially with our previous product, WSO2 ESB, um, uh, we have noticed that uh, people need a very robust usable language to write these integrations in. So most products, as well as our previous um, WSO2 ESB, uh, operates on XML-based configuration language which is great for uh, writing the high level structure, but uh, most of the time you need uh, additional um, logic, additional uh, 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 control over the, these integrations, these APIs you write. And uh, it is very difficult to do that directly using um, XML based configuration language or any other configuration language for that matter. So we saw the gap that there is a, um, uh, there's in the integration space where there's no language that is uh, uh, specifically suited for this space that um, to write integrations well. Um, so we started um, developing Ballerina uh, as a programming language to cater to um, write integrations, APIs uh, in, uh, uh, in a very convenient way, right? So uh, that's how we started. We started this as the replacement language for our previous product, WC2 ESB, um, and significant time back, actually, is 2016. Um, so it takes a time to develop a language. Uh, so we had to do a lot of experimentation. Uh, we first uh, did a kind of a rough version, not rough, uh, like a, um, that is based on AST, um, uh, interpreted language, that means um, the language doesn't compile down to anything. It's just uh, like um, all the JavaScript or all the Python, right? It runs on the, uh, based on the past pre. Right? Um, and we, we use this model to kind of um, validate our ideas, improve our ideas, uh, get it to into a kind of a coherent place. And then um, once we were there, we felt like it is, you know, time to take the jump in speed, jump in performance. And then we implemented um, Valina virtual machine, BVM, um, that is kind of a bytecode like interpretation, right? Uh, if you look at a lot of mod modern, uh, uh, languages still work on this kind of byte code, right? So we compile the Ballerina code into an internal um, byte code syntax, byte code format, and then we run that byte code uh, on our own interpreter. Um, and then we felt like that is also not as performant as we like. Again, with this phase, again, help us to clarify our ideas, improve our ideas and so on. And then uh, in the next phase, what we did was we went from this PIR, this internal format uh, to Java bytecode. So um, this is also around the time I joined and uh, I've been, I, I was a member of uh, uh, this bytecode generation team as well. Um, so we um, we were able to like create dot class files and then out of those dot class files char files and then that gives us a native way uh, not native but um, good enough way to run on um, uh, JVM right and JVM is is uh, very well tuned to these kind of things so it it does its own optimizations and that helps uh, to run our uh, compiled product much faster. So that has been our basic um, infrastructure from 2018 up to now. Uh, so our uh, the so so these previous versions um, we had multiple previous versions and but this version which we released in um, 2022 as Swan Lake is our kind of long term um, version. Uh, so. We've been releasing from uh, to the to 2022 up to now uh, various uh, updates for the same version. So this adds new features, but uh, we don't uh, break the basic syntax or um, the basic uh, functionality. So uh, since 2000, 
2022, we've been backward compatible. So uh, uh, now it is ready to be uh, deployed um, like after 2022. So we have some uh, customers who are using this. We have customers for the previous products, uh, previous versions as well, but uh, after 2022, uh, uh, we feel comfortable saying this is the this is our long term version um, going forward, and we keep uh, releasing continuous updates for this version. Now let's get a little bit into the language details, right? So um, as I said, we we uh, went and developed this language because we wanted language that uh, is uniquely suited for writing integrations, writing APIs, right? So we have come up with uh, language features that are useful, that are that are very um, uh, well fitting for writing these APIs. Right? So uh, one of the key features in the language is the type system and the values. So they kind of go hand in hand um, because type is um, kind of specification and then value is the instance, right? So these are kind of the same thing, but um, they both have unique properties that um, that you might not see in a lot of languages. So Ballerina's type system is, is a static type system, uh, but it is um, it is nominally type. Uh, it is statically typed, uh, opposed to nominally typed. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, is like if you take a language like Java or C plus uh, plus of many object-oriented languages, uh, the uh, substance of a type, right? That is a class uh, or a struct or anything like that. It comes from um, the name of it, right? So uh, when you name something uh, person class and that, that has a ID and that word person, the, the string that the, give, that the name you give to that class is very important because that name is what identifies that class, right? Um, so if you have another class uh, with, the, let's say, the admin, but with the same properties, right? Let's say it has the ID, it has a name, it has account, everything is same, but it has a different name, then the system recognizes as a different class, right? So it is, uh, you can't even usually cast between those, right? You can't um, cast a class just because it has all the same properties, you can't even do that, right? So, um, but on the other hand, Ballerina is, is uh, based on uh, structure. That means the compiler um, at a deep level don't care about the name you give to uh, these records, right? So our primary um, structure is records. Of course, we have class because Ballerina is kind of multi uh, paradigm language, but um, main way people use Ballerina is through records and the records um, are structurally typed. So uh, if you look at other languages, uh, so uh, that are structurally typed. So a Go has some structurally typed areas. Like if you look at Go interfaces, they are structurally typed, but Go, um, other areas of Go is not structurally typed. Especially data is not structurally, structurally typed. And we feel that is kind of the key area uh, when it comes to uh, network communication that use, needs to be structured. Type. And um, if you look at uh, TypeScript, TypeScript is also structured type. So one difference there is um, unlike TypeScript, um, our structure is guaranteed to be this way, right? For example, uh, if you at any given point, if you can assign something to this customer uh, record, your screen on the screen and then it success, succeeds, that means it has to have all these fails, right? So, uh, and that is guaranteed. Uh, you can't kind of do casting or any kind of weird thing to get around that. So it is guaranteed. It is very um, uh, strongly st uh, statically typed, right? So um, the reason TypeScript is not like that is because uh, because they have run on JavaScript engine. So it's not that they, they, are not dis they didn't do that for a arbitrary reason, they, they had limitations, but we, we have, uh, but we have designed a more strict language 
uh, if you know these kind of systems. Otherwise, you can get into very uh, weird situations when your when your type system is not strong like this, right? So we have this strong type system that is based on structure. So how does this um, tie into APIs, right? So um, why this is useful when you're writing APIs is when you get a JSON object from some service or you expose a JSON object to outside world, you are never going to talk about what type, it, what class it is, right? So class is implied. So the, so the notion that it has a class doesn't make any sense in an API world, right? So uh, that class is some arbitrary thing you attach at the point after you're getting it off the wire. So in Ballerina, what, it, what matters is the data itself, right? So it is much closely reflecting how the API worlds work. Um, and you can see other advantage of this kind of thinking when you're writing APIs. I'll uh, show you in the demo section when you're writing API, uh, things like uh, open and close principle, for example, that is uh, you can uh, uh, accept um, objects that kind of X that has extra properties uh, uh, because that's kind of how JSON works. And um, you can, but when you're returning, you can return precise types. So all of that is supported by um, this kind of structural type system. So this plays very nicely with JSON kind of uh, data oriented world. Right? So um, looking at the other side of the same coin is uh, looking at values. Values is basically an instance of the previously talked types. And um, main thing you, you notice here is our types looks very similar to JSON, um, but uh, they're not, you know, we don't have to explicitly define what uh, uh, JSON is because the type system um, can um, understand JSON as uh, this composite type itself. I'll, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but um, um, what you can see is these values are not like like a, a class where you have to, you know, you have to um, have an equals method, you have to define a comparator to compare them, and you can't, you know, uh, you can't clone them, anything like that. So, so instead of that, all object oriented a set of ideas we have much closer to web kind of ideas where it is piece of data you can copy it you can easily compare it like you normally equals to json objects you can equal these ballerina records you can uh, compare them you can see which one is you know in the sorting order larger it's very trivial so it behaves very closely uh, to the to the JSON objects you know and love you know, from the API side of things. Of course, we have support to XML as well. Uh, so XML also works very similar to this kind of value semantics. So both are kind of natively supported. So this whole type system and value system uh, plays well together and plays well with how you write APIs. Right. Um, again, error handling. Error handling is... Um, is something you have to like uh, 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 always deal with when you are working with networks. So we, we, we don't believe kind of hiding the network fact behind something. So that is also the reason we use this arrow syntax instead of dot get, because whenever there's a kind of network um, interaction happening, uh, we encourage the user to note that and then treat it as such. Um, also our Error handling is based on return values and um, uh, a type system is will help us here as well because our type system supports um, having uh, what you call like some types and product types. Um, but simply what it means is you can say, say a variable is, uh, is of type client or error. So um, you can check on that. I'll, Again, go a little bit more detail in the demo section uh, with their handling. 
Um, next thing I want to highlight is concurrency. Concurrency is again, uh, very much a requirement when you are working with uh, APIs uh, and when you are working with uh, network basically, because clients will make concurrent calls to you, you know, HTTP clients or so GRPC client, whatever, and you have to respond to them in a um, kind of concurrent manner, but you don't have to, uh, you can't like go and spawn new threads every time you get a connection uh, because that will exhaust the thread threads in your machine and it's also slow. Uh, this create a thread pool kind of situations. Um, so what we have is basically uh, what's called green threads, uh, user space threads, uh, but um, with the syntax of Ballerina and feature set of Ballerina, users don't have to uh, kind of um, you know, grapple with these uh, concurrency concepts in their day-to-day -day programming because sort of it is handled by the language itself. I'll, I'll again go into it in a little bit more detail. So I'm giving you a kind of broad picture here. But uh, again, we have those constructs that can be explicitly called, which is I'm showing here. Uh, workers is one such concept where you can spawn work into multiple workers and wait for them. So this is all built into the language syntax itself. But um, even more powerful is the implicit things. So um, which I'll go into in the demo and the in the future slides where you don't have to even think about concurrency, uh, but the language is designed so the concurrency happens even without uh, developers uh, explicitly thinking about it in in lot of cases. And whenever you don't um, get it automatically, you can always use these workers and uh, strands, uh, specifically starting strands to get all this explicitly. Right. So let me show you a little couple of examples of the Ballerina type system and then um, concurrency before we jump into the demonstration right so here is an example where um, we have defined a new type uh, a type being um, color being red or uh, green or blue so this is closer to what you think of as an enum in a lot of languages but um, here it is modeled uh, based on basically set theory so any relationship you think of from set theory should be valid here, right? That means if you have another type uh, called uh, red, red or green, uh, you can see this color becomes automatically a super type of that type, right? So because subset, right? Subset here. Uh, so all of these um, like intuitive things, you don't have to program, you don't have to write extends or anything like that. It uh, works automatically based on set theory, right? So this um, type system is, is kind of complex to implement, but uh, as a user, it feels very intuitive, right? If I explain that to you, you can, you can obviously think, yes, of course, right? So, um, and, uh, the next example is the that subtype supertype structural supertype uh, example. Again, you, you can see I have uh, defined two types: user and employee. And uh, in in a traditional OOP language, you usually have to write employee extends user, right? But in Ballerina, you don't have to write that. And uh, Ballerina language knows that employee extends user because it can see that ID. Uh, the and the name is in one thing and the other one only has a name. So the employee must extend user, right? So, and assigning like this now, like automatically works, right? So again, uh, this, this kind of behavior is what you expect from an API because for example, if you earlier return uh, a small object, now you are returning a large object from the API, you expect that the API to automatically work, right? Uh, with your client. And now it is working nicely with the API, uh, with our type system. Uh, 
again, uh, another example of um, like a read-only value. So instead of const, we have um, and read-only because this is again, based on set theory. So, and here uh, works like the intersect operator, but intersection is not very commonly used um, like uh, union. Union is the most common thing you'll see, but intersection is useful for places like this. Um, and then uh, other thing is like, um, um, so how you think about these types is how you think about basically like a um, uh, open API schema, right? Or XML schema from all days if you if you have programmed in all days. So um, so Ballina types are more similar to open API spec or Swagger specification than a traditional uh, double OP type system, right? So because uh, open API schema talks about how object is created, uh, how object you know properties are there, right? And that's what ballerina type system is also doing. Uh, it is not like how you, um, you know, what are the names of things, which is what normal OOP uh, type systems do. Again, this, uh, as I said, this whole, um, um, whole uh, type, sy type system is, is fairly complicated when it comes to implementation. Uh, fortunately, we had a lot of um, mathematical uh, grounds uh, created for us by uh, this professor, uh, Giuseppe, uh, uh, from France. And he his work is also integrated in some other programming languages as well. So uh, our work is based on that mathematical foundation. Uh, so it all kind of works out with the set theory. Uh, right. Let's go a little, you know, let's see a little couple of some examples from the values uh, section. Uh, so our main built-in types are Boolean names, floats, um, the strings. So a lot of these are what you expect from, you know, there's not a lot of surprises. Boolean is a Boolean, true or false. Uh, int is, um, int is a 64-bit integer. So we don't have like, all a lot of types of integers because um, uh, we find the integer type cor corrections, coercions, casting, all of that creates a lot of errors that are very you know hard to debug. Um, and then in modern machines, uh, usually even if you try to use like a 32-bit integer, it will anyway use a 64 in a lot of cases. So there's no no lot of no advantage at the end of the day, you know, you are only paying a price. So we have ints, 64-bit uh, ints as the, our main type, but there's a catch, uh, there's a kind of a uh, uh, catch at the end, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, and then uh, floats, our floats are again 64-bit floats. Um, yeah, there's no reason to use uh, smaller floats unless you're working with AI training these days, um, uh, because all, all the machines that we use to create APIs all support 64-bit floats anyway. Uh, strings, are immutable strings, arrays, tuples, um, map, all are uh, hopefully familiar. Records is what I talked about earlier. So that is like uh, a collection of these uh, fields. Um, and then decimal is, a, we want to especially promote the use of decimals for um, a lot of public facing APIs, uh, especially like if you get a um, number, uh, like a currency related uh, or financial related numbers, uh, you don't want to lose any digits. Um, what do I mean by this is like, uh, you know, in floats, you just divide by like, um, one divided by three is like zero point, not exactly that, right? So it is, it is um, I triple I, I uh, 64 float, but, but usually it doesn't come out right when you're presenting it to the users 
also it doesn't come out right when you save it to a database uh, and then you want to generate reports off of it or uh, things like that right so we want to promote any kind of financial data any kind of user uh, presented data to be recorded as decimals especially if they go through that kind of you know operations mathematical operations right and then it will it will preserve its uh, exact precise decimal points right so this is based on like one to eight uh, bit decimals um and then we have uh, first class support for xmls um again one of the uh, main um, contributors to this language uh, the language designers is james clark james clark um, is the editor of the xml specification so he knows uh, about xml than most people i think uh, uh, out there so he helped us uh, to design the xml to be uh, very uh, you know very easy to work with and also spec compliant right because there are a lot of edge cases and corner cases that we, we have to get right uh, so this, uh, I, I talked about, give a hint that when we say we only support 64 bit ints, but there's a small catch, you can define something as a byte, but what it means is uh, it is, uh, we are just giving a compiler hint saying, um, the not a hint actually, we are specifying the compiler, the value we are going to store in this 64 bit int is always within the byte range, right? So uh, why this uh, this doing it this way is um, then you will not never get any kind of you know casting issues, up, uh, automatic conversions, upcasting, all of that bugs are not there because uh, we are always dealing with sixty four bit integers, so it is very hard to get um, run into issues with this scheme. But uh, we are telling the compiler that we are only going to store uh, values within this range because the compiler is free to do any optimizations on behalf of us. But as long as the semantics match the 64-bit int semantics, right? So this is very useful when you want to create large arrays um, of bytes. Uh, so uh, another useful thing is uh, char char is very similar. Um, it is it is not a first class first class thing. It is uh, basically a string with a single character. Um, again, we didn't want to add yet another type, uh, so it, it works seamlessly with strings. But it is a special string, basically class. Um, uh, any string with a length one is basically a char. And uh, JSON is also like that. It is not first class because JSON within the language is defined using previously said types, right? So um, JSON is specified within the language as either a Boolean or an int or a float or a string or an array or a map, right? So JSON is a composite type. So we have only given it a nice name, right? Uh, so the advantage of that is now the language natively understands, okay, if I say this is a JSON, it understands, okay, that can be an int or a Boolean or something like that. So if you do, a, if check, it knows um, how to validate that, right? Um, again, a couple of examples for all of these types, uh, especially for, for JSON and XML, and then we I have a tuple type that's a little bit uh, special. Not a lot of languages have tuple types, but tuples are very useful when you want to return multiple values. This 3D point is a tuple, basically, right? So that's like an array where you can only store a predefined type amount of elements, like three elements in this case. Um, and then um, we have a special table type. So I'm not going to go too detailed into that. That is helpful when you want to uh, store a larger number of records, but also access them efficiently. 
Um, and then uh, we have immutable types, uh, thanks to the read-only um, uh, keyword we have, um, we can, you can add, uh, um, intersect with uh, read-only. And then um, all of these values behave like, um, like uh, not like objects, but as simple data, right? So that's the last point, which is you can compare them, you can uh, see if see if they are the similar they can you can easily print them right just uh, your printer len you don't have to write a two string or anything so they purely work like uh, data right uh, again uh, let me talk a little bit about concurrency so i earlier showed you a sample of concurrency defined explicitly and the second example here is also something similar but what is more important is the first example here, which uh, if you look at it, uh, again, you will not see it as a concurrent code, right? So you're not seeing any threads, you're not seeing any special keyword, you're not seeing any keyword like async, uh, anything like that. But uh, these two lines like uh, hello equals that line and then next line, especially the greeting and then this get is concurrent. Uh, so how that works is um, when Barona is interpreting, uh, not interpreting actually, executing this code, uh, it goes line by line, right? Whenever it hits this kind of concurrent code, uh, while the concurrent code is going on, um, uh, let's say it is waiting to actual HTTP to return this object, or return this stream from a remote client. Uh, now that uh, physical thread uh, is free to do some other work, right? And um, what happens is Barina will kind of uh, pause the current strand at that point and then uh, use the physical thread behind that strand to do more work, right? If you have more work, if you don't have more work, so of course you can't do anything, you just have to wait. But if you have more work, uh, it will switch to doing that work, right? So basically you write code like you normally would without thinking about concurrency, but due to the way Ballerina is designed, it is automatically concurrent, right? So this is um, uh, a huge advantage when you are working with Ballerina in the HTTP or any other services, any other API space, because these APIs are massively parallel, right? So a lot of uh, incoming requests and you don't have to think about concurrency in a lot of places, right? So concurrency is automatic for the most part. Of course, there are places where you want to explicitly say, run this in a parallel way, uh, especially when you have calculation, especially something, then there's a, a CPU bounding, right? And uh, those cases you can use either start keyword or the workers thing I showed you earlier. Uh, but those are kind of, uh, not that common, right? So uh, advantage of balance of concurrency is in a lot of places, especially places where you have this kind of IO bound um, concurrency, IO bound delays, uh, which is the most common thing, uh, more common thing when it, when it comes to writing APIs that is automatically handled. Uh, you only have to write concurrency explicitly when you have certain, these kind of calculations uh, CPU bound kind of uh, weights, right? So, so this is this is a huge advantage when it comes to Barina concurrency. Again, uh, if you know about function coloring problem, that is uh, like uh, some languages you have to specifically say async uh, in front of the methods that use async. So that <clears throat> creates a problem that you have to go and change your whole code base. Uh, putting async everywhere. Sometimes you have to remove that async back. You know, back in Barina, there's no such a thing. Everything, anywhere you can be async. Uh, the whole system works as a uh, uh, concurrent system, right? Um, of course, uh, the drawback is there's a, a constant, you know, overhead to this kind of user space threads, but um, that is usually offset by, in a in a concurrent, in a, API kind of environment, this kind of 
cost is usually well justified because the concurrency advantage is higher. Right. Um, I think that's pretty much the uh, the uh, explaining part. Let's move on to uh, demonstration part. Right. So. Um, Hello, hi. If you have any questions from, from the previous section, feel free to ask. Um, and anyway, you can ask questions while I'm doing the demonstration as well. Hope it's good. Um, so first of all, um, I, I encourage everyone to go to, um, go to um, barrenow.io website. Uh, which is our main website and download Ballerina from here. Uh, if you haven't already, um, if you have already downloaded, uh, you can use the Ballerina um, list command to update your local Ballerina version to the latest version. Right. So, uh, so once you download and install Ballerina from here, um, you will. You will start seeing. Um, you'll be able to run bal command in your CLI, and this is basically our like all-in tool. So you can see the basic command. Uh, the the, the uh, all right, Let me let me let me mute you for now. Uh, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself. Um. Uh, or feel. Feel free to um, ask in the chat as well. Um, right. So, um, of course, you can see these commands that are related to um, writing programming uh, projects and then running them, right, and packaging them. But uh, also, you can see this whole other section of tools that are very specific to writing APIs. You can see a gRPC tool, GraphQL tool, Open API tool, Async API tool. All of these are very helpful when you write, want to write uh, APIs that talk over the network. Also, we have Persist uh, tool, which is helpful to write um, when you want to talk to databases. Also, um, BindGen tool is useful to write, uh, talk to other Java, uh, Java local API calls, right? So um, you can see from, from the the tool itself, we are very um, aware of the API ecosystem and we tightly integrate to API ecosystem. Uh, so let me start by creating a, a, a new project. Um, so bal new is the command for that and then Let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, so by default, Ballerina will uh, tool will create these two files, and uh, our recommended way of uh, writing Ballerina is, of course, using VS Code uh, and Ballerina VS Code plugin. So if I open this using VS Code, um, I have already installed the plugin so I can get these nice colors and completions. So if you haven't installed, uh, go here and then just type Ballerina and then install the first plugin and you will get this um, nice coloring and completion and everything, right? Um, so once you once you come here, uh, let's, let me start by like just running it to see Hello world works, bell run is the command. Um, if you if this is the first time you are running Bellrina, it'll take a little bit of time to pull every all the dependencies, but I have already done it, so it's much faster. Uh, again, there's also a faster way of running this. If you are on a de developer machine, we have experimental fast run, which can kind of instantly run as well. Uh, um, but let, let's not go into that. Uh, I, have to, I haven't, might not be have set up the fast run yet in this machine. Okay, so 
so the project we are going to project I'm going to demo today is is based on calling an API and exposing it as our own API. Right, it's a very common case in in almost any integration is to create an API. Uh, which calls uh, yet another API and do some manipulation on the data, right? Uh, so the API I've picked is basically, um, what I'm going to do is um, kind of uh, create a gift picking API, right? Gift picking service, basically, not even an API, gift picking service where, um, uh, you know, affiliate links, right? So I send some traffic to Apple uh, iTunes, to buy a gift and then I get a small uh, commission, right? Affiliate commission uh, from that. So I kind of suggest gifts for people to buy and then I get some, I get to make some money, right? So that's that's our kind of project, our, our uh, pet project. And uh, what I'm going to do is basically call this API, let me, uh, Apple, affiliate search API, right? So if I go here, you see they provide API to search iTunes here and I think there are examples here. So examples look like this. So if I call this API, uh, it'll, it'll send some JSON and then I can use that JSON to present some UI or some service. And then when people buy using that link, I can get some money, right? So this is the whole idea. And uh, let me let me do a curl command. I show you this API. Um, right, so this is the API. So I look at the API I did. Here I did search for Beatles and then I pass it through JQ command line tool to get some color, uh, but that's a simple curl, right? So, and I get all of this JSON information. So let's let's now try to do the same thing using Ballerina. Okay. So first I want to create a HTTP, um, uh, HTTP client. So I get a red thing, of course, and it says there's a, uh, again, when you, uh, when you install the uh, Ballerina plugin, you get all these completions, very helpful. So it does these kind of corrections automatically. It shows, okay, uh, this one, this one needs uh, iTunes URL. Uh, let me put that in. So I'm gonna put, GTP iTunes here. Yeah. And then it started showing an error. It says uh, this is not uh, HTTP client. It has to be HTTP client and O error, right? So this is this is what I talk about in the error section. So Ballerina, how Ballerina errors work is basically it returns the error. So it's yet another type in a way. So I have to say this one is an error. So I can, I can actually put the exact type here as well, but you know, uh, as you can see, I can put the exact type. I can copy paste from here. This is client error. So I can put client error here, but uh, so HTTP. But since client error is a, is ex, it, it extends error, I can just put error here as well, right? So normal, um, so this kind of, this is how Balna error types work, right? So it is basically error returns not throwing. So since it doesn't throw anywhere, uh, unless it is kind of a kind of a, a panic situation, you can be confident that your application doesn't, you know, there's no, no forgotten try catches or anything like that. Um, and then what I need to do is if this is not an error, if this is uh, not an error, I can do something with it, right? So if it is an error, I can't do anything. So another way of writing this is, if this is error, return, right? 
and then so by, as you can see banana type system is uh, smart enough to figure out if now i check this situation and they return so the type of c must be um, client at this point right so this is now this is good to go let me rename it properly itunes right um and then what i want to do is itunes dot get so it's again not dot because uh, any uh, these kind of calls are we do not buy um arrow the network interaction uh, so we have a couple of syntaxes we have this syntax the slash base syntax uh, which is actually what we recommend for the most cases but let me let me use the get syntax today uh, uh, again let me just copy paste this from the curl command so again barana is saying uh, okay i need to assign this to a type uh, so let me call this this is some json right i know that this is some json so so this is okay so uh, now it is saying it is uh, it, it is JSON or error, right? Again, this can't be just JSON. It has to be error because it, something can go wrong here. So now that's all good. So now if again, this search is error, I can't do anything, right? So I have to return, return, and then otherwise I can print this. So this looks not great, it, it, it's okay, but it's not great, right? Because uh, uh, again, if you look, use most languages, it is going to be even harder than this. But um, even this, I think we can improve. Let's first of all, we call this and see if this is working. Right, it's working. Let me put some color on, I'm not sure this works. So Jake, you can put some color onto this. Yeah, it works, right? So same thing we got. We uh, so uh, when it comes to error handling, Balena provides this check keyword, right? Uh, first of all, one good thing to do here is actually return the actual error here, so it can print the error. So if I put returns error question mark, so you can return errors from main functions in Balena. So what happens is if there is an error, it will actually print the error. So this is actually good practice to actually return the error, not just empty return. Uh, but uh, what's cool is uh, in Barina, instead of saying this all the time, uh, this is very common in Goal. So this error return type is, uh, is popularized uh, by Go language. I think there are other languages that use this. But uh, one thing it suffers is you have to put this all the time. And that's very ugly, right? You have to put this thing. So Balina, in Balina, what you can do is you can put this check keyword here and you can get rid of this whole thing. So check key keyword is exactly similar to this thing, right? So what this means is if it is an error, return it. Otherwise you can go forward. So you can get rid of this. You can get rid of this. And again, same thing here, same thing here. Right, so we are finally down to two lines. Hopefully, what does this say? Uh, okay, now yes, we need to check keyword here. Right, so now we are finally down to three lines. Right, so I think this this is really good. I don't think in many languages you can do like a three line uh, HTTP call, uh, especially given that this is also concurrent. Right, there's concurrency going on here if the of course, in this small application, it doesn't matter because there's nothing else to do. But if this was a large application, uh, this is uh, similar to in, uh, in if you write in some other language, this is like uh, you are writing a, a callback and then in the callback, you print it, right? So here there's no callbacks, but it works same, the same way, right? So it is, it is um, short and sweet. 
when you want to write HTTP calls? Of course it is because the language is specially designed to work with APIs. Now, uh, let's, let's put a little bit more types onto this. Again, as I said, types are a key feature uh, into Bar on Barina, but let's, let's try to see why, why we want to do this, right? So what I want to do from here is now a kind of return a JSON. So I don't want to return this whole huge JSON, right? So this is the same JSON I get, but I, I only want to return something that looks um, uh, like, like a certain uh, pick couple of fields, right? I only care about the album name and maybe album URL or something like that. So let's say it's just the album name. I want to return array of album names. But before that, I have to convert this into a service. So let's look at the service uh, interface, right? So service interface is simple as writing service. Um, and then you can see we, we, ex we have a lot of these um, listeners implemented. So whether it's gRPC, whether it's uh, TCP, WebSocket, web um, gRPC, everything is pre-implemented. So you can just jump right in. But I'm going to use the most plain thing, which is HTTP. Uh, so I'll use ADAD, or you can use uh, any other report. Let me add a, add a resource here. So uh, let me. So now all I have to do is just move this logic right here. And then I can simply return the search for now. And then this. It's not bad. Some errors because again, uh, it says this check operator work, I should be able to return errors. Of course, because check operator, all it does is returning errors if it is an error, right? So I have, this one has to be error or JSON. Uh, and uh, let me pick a different port, I must be having some. running programs. Okay, so it's running actually. Um, let me now curl HTTP to slash slash localhost eight is what I put and pick a gift. And good, right? So we, we just got, so writing a service is kind of merely putting a couple of lines on top of that. So it is, and uh, it looks, you know, very clean. Um, again, this is language is spe specifically designed to write APIs, right? So writing APIs uh, with this language is easier as writing a main method in any other language. Uh, now, what I want to do next is, as I said, uh, I, I don't want to return this whole thing. I just want to return a kind of a small record, right? I want to re return like um, JSON with just the artist, uh, the album name and the URL, right? So for that, uh, let me start defining a type. So this is the whole types um, thing I talked about. So let me... Uh, define type call album 
uh, and then now to create this this thing i want to iterate this search right so we know from the json uh, return structure uh, it is a big json with uh, results right inside the results there's a kind of a, a bunch of objects right so first thing i want to do is search dot result right um, now i want to use this as an array right so for each uh, var album in this thing, right? So now Ballerina starts complaining, saying, okay, this one is JSON, or this one is a, a JSON. So it doesn't know what this dot result is, right? Dot result. At best, it can be a JSON or it can even be an error because there's no result, right? So at this point, uh, you need to tell Ballerina, okay, what this this iTunes is returning an object that has results and that is an error uh, array, right? So for that, let me define a type. So iTunes. Um, and then it has a results thing, right? And then that is basically, let, let, I don't have to tell you too much. I can say it, it's a JSON array. Um, and then I can say, this is the iTunes thing. So uh, right, so, Um, okay, so yes, I mean, this that's you already saw the advantage of what I just did, right? So I made a mistake here because uh, instead of results s, I have type result here, and fortunately, Balina told me, right? Balina is highlighting it on the thread. And I, I'm trying to figure out what's going wrong. Of course, I need to put an S here, right? So that is basically the advantage. Uh, you just, uh, I mean, I didn't plan that, but uh, it nicely demonstrate what the advantage is. Um, as soon as you tell Ballerina uh, what the type is, it can provide you with um, completions. Like I can put dot here and then it will put this word here, right? Uh, completions work and as well as uh, errors work, everything works, right? But also uh, it's different from other languages. As you can see, um, I started by just saying Ballerina, this is a JSON, right? I didn't tell it, it is I, this, this record, it has a results, everything upfront and it worked, right? So Ballerina's uh, advantage is you can, you know, kind of refine these types. You can put all this information onto the types as you go, right? You don't have to start by typing the whole type uh, in the beginning. Uh, you can only use types as much as, only as much as you need it, right? So uh, again, now I want to, from this um, album, I want to create a new, new array, right? So I want to create an album array, album array, because this is what I'm going to return, right? So I want to result array and I'm going to result dot push. I'm going to put into this array um, uh, from this album dot what right. So uh, the problem here is if you look at this thing, it doesn't, it only knows it as JSON, of course, because I told you it, it is a JSON, right? So I want, if I put something like, so I want to return album name. So that's what I want to return. Uh, so I'm going to put name here. Okay. 
um, here I want to put is album dot what's the real name? What's, what's returning by iTunes call it artist name not artist name I want the collection type collection name right so iTunes call it collection name so I want to access it like this right now again the same problem I didn't tell Ballerina that there's a collection name inside this because I told it it's just a JSON but at this point, I can go and kind of refine the type. This is what I talk about, right? You don't have to define all the types in the world in the beginning. You can kind of roughly define the type. And then as you go, you can refine the type, right? Uh, let me refine the type a little bit now. This is iTunes. Uh, let me call that iTunes item. Uh, record. And so you might be noticing that some of these records, I have put this bar and some of these, I don't have put a bar. So what that means is without the bar means it's an open record. Open record means I'm telling Ballerina there are, there are other things I don't know, right? So I'm, I'm not telling Ballerina, right? So for example, here, uh, not only results, there's a kind of another thing, right? There's a result count. And if, inside the item, there are a lot of items, a lot of properties, right? All of the properties are there. So I'm not going to tell Ballerina every single thing. I'm only going to tell Ballerina uh, what I need. So that is what I mean by this open record. So Ballerina knows there's more in this record, but Ballerina don't know about those things. So this is very useful because this is called open close principle. So you can be liberal with what you accept. That means uh, when you are getting a record from um, someone else, for example, uh, Apple decide to add another field to this JSON, uh, your program don't break because uh, Ballerina already knows there are additional things here and it's ready to accept those things. Right? Uh, but uh, when you, you are returning something, you are returning a closed record. That means um, uh, when you are returning, you precisely only ever re uh, return this exact thing. Right? So this is uh, open to extend. Uh, uh, but you are close on uh, what you expose, right? You are not, you are conservative with what you expose, but liberal with what you ex accept. Uh, let me put what I need here. So collection, collection, collection name is what I want. So I'll put collection name here. That's a string. Right, and then I have to tell this is array of that, and then now type is good enough, right? Again, I didn't do the full type; I did a good enough type. Uh, so now Balna knows. Okay, this one has a collection, and that's a string, and it is happy, right? Um, so let me restart the program. Um, Oh, of course, I, I didn't return anything this time, so that's my bad. I'm going to return result, and I'm also going to change the type to reflect that I'm going to return an array of albums. Again, uh, advantage of uh, defining these precise types with Ballerina, just we, rather than saying um, I'm returning a JSON. Again, if I just say JSON here, uh, it's going to work because this is a JSON at the end of the day. But as when you put precise types, uh, it helps the reader to understand as well as if you generate something like um, open API uh, specification from this, like Ballerina provides tools to uh, create um, Swagger um, files from this, uh, open API specifications from this. Uh, at that point, all of this information, like what really this returns, uh, album and album has a name, all that goes into the um, specification, right? So as you can see, it all worked and I get a transformed array uh, just with the names, right? Just as you, as we expected. And let me put 
so this is perfectly good code and it is only a couple of lines we were able to do what we wanted but uh, let me just to show a nice cool bad enough feature you can use here to make it even shorter uh, we have this query uh, syntax so we have this syntax where you can say um, from uh, from uh, this is just another way of saying the same thing uh, using slightly shorter syntax using query syntax and that that sh that should do the same thing basically uh, so I can rerun but uh, again that's three lines to do a kind of a nice integration where you call an API do a transformation and then expose it as a yet another API right all of that in three lines uh, so you are getting a lot of bang for the buck uh, all right, with that, uh, let me end, end the demo section as well, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, talk as well. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer right now or even uh, in our Discord channel. Uh, so I hope I was able to intrigue you uh, with our programming language and now you understand uh, how it is uh, really suitable, well suited for writing uh, APIs and integrations in general. Um, hope you can give us a try. Uh, please visit us at Baronado.io uh, and download and give us a try. Uh, and we'd love to hear any feedback. Um, please go to uh, please go to uh, our Discord community channel. Uh, this is uh, again listed in the Baron IO site. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we are all there to answer you. Um, and uh, and also please uh, go to our GitHub and then add a star that helps to get it visible. We already got uh, 3.5K stars. Uh, so uh, we appreciate your help there as well. So just come here and then um, if you have any questions, go to help uh, section and then ask questions. And I can, I or anyone else from Balina team can answer these questions and get you into writing APIs with Balina, right? Um, all right. Uh, I hope you had a nice session and uh, thank you very much.